Well, good morning again. I got to tell you all that this morning at the nine o'clock, that bumper fired me up. I have not had a chance to see it yet this week until at nine o'clock when it dropped. And that part that says, when he said, gather, grow, and go, he wasn't talking to the building. I was like, Oh man, that will preach. That was just like spiritual face punch right there. He was talking to the body, not the building. I was like, oh, come on. We're going to get, we're going to have some fun this morning. How are y'all? Good. Y'all look a lot more awake than nine o'clock was. And nine, I know nine o'clock was eight o'clock and now 11 o'clock is actually, you know, 10 o'clock, but that's okay. We're glad you're here. Uh, if you are new this morning, if you're a guest this morning, uh, today is a little bit different. Normally what you would see at this time in our service is a big screen would drop down and our senior pastor, Philip Lee, would be sharing with us, teaching us, communicating to us, preaching and all uh, live via a video, uh, usually from our Banks Mill campus, but sometimes from another campus like he did here a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but uh, every once in a while, every five or six weeks or so, either strategic or sometimes by accident, uh, we have campus pastors have an opportunity uh, to speak live. And so today is one of those. Uh, we are kicking off a new series called Be the Church. And so at all of our locations, uh, there'll be somebody other than Pastor Philip speaking this morning. And today I am super fired up because I love Be the Church. I will tell you that this idea uh, is not a new concept for Cedar Creek. Uh, it's been around and really it's been the heart of Cedar Creek from the very beginning. But about uh, 11 years ago, uh, the actual Be the Church as a, as a branding and as an expression for us came to life out of necessity. Uh, we had an opportunity, the West Campus, where we weren't going to be able to meet. We were still meeting in a portable location at the um, Convocation Center. And we, when we couldn't be in there, we had to go to the Etheridge Center. Anybody here remember those days? Were you here back then? I know some of you were. Yeah. And so uh, that particular Sunday, we had nowhere to gather. We were like a homeless church. And so we were sitting around saying, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And we're all freaking out. And I don't remember who it was, but somebody said, well, let's not go to church. Why don't we go be the church? And it was like, Boom, right, mind blown. What does that mean? What does that even look like? And so we just went out uh, that uh, Sunday. We went out and we served people in the community. And we've done that several times, uh, all of our locations, church-wide since then. And so we're doing that again uh, this time of year, right now, starting today. So for the next three weeks, we're going to be together. And then three Sundays from today on the 29th, we are going to not have uh, our gathering, our worship gathering in any of our locations or online. Uh, we're going to be going out and serving in the community. And so I share that with you today so that you can put it down. And to tell you that all of our, uh, if you're in a home group, you already know this because we've been talking about it over the last several weeks. Uh, home groups have been planning, coming together, thinking about what they're going to do on that serve day. And so if you're not in a group or you're new, um, this is a great opportunity for you to connect with the home group and be a part of one of these community service projects. And so before you get out of here today, um, take that program that you're taking notes on, check the box that says home group or write in the, in the blank lines. You can write BTC, Be the Church uh, Project and we will give you a call or shoot you an email and we will get you connected this week. Over the next three weeks, as we're talking about what it means to be the church, we're going to explore those three words that you already saw in the, uh, in the bumper. It is gather, grow, and go. We're going to be talking about what it means to be the church as we gather, what it means to be the church as we grow together, and then what it means to be the church as we go out and serve the community. It's interesting, uh, when we read the Bible, when you look at the New Testament, when you look at the earthly ministry of Jesus, these are three of the things, three of the main things that you see Jesus doing, right? I mean, he, he gathered a crowd, and then he would teach, he would heal, he would do the work that he was called to do, and then he would send them out, right? And so he would gather them, he would help them to grow spiritually, and then he would send them out to go. And, and, and you know what? That happens today. Isn't that true? When Jesus is working, doesn't a crowd gather? Sure it does. I mean, why are you here today, right? We're here today because Jesus is working in our church and we see the evidence of that week in and week out as new people come and Jesus continues to grow his church. You know, it doesn't shock me, and those of you that heard me back in January talk about this, that uh, last year we saw an 8% increase in our Sunday attendance here at the West Campus. That's incredible. How many of you would love for your 401k to jump 8% in a year, right? That's, that's sustained growth. Your businesses, business people, wouldn't you love 8% a year? Sure you would. That is incredible. Why? Because Jesus is working. And our Sunday mornings are all about gathering a crowd together so that we can celebrate Jesus. Celebrate him, who he is, what he has done, and why we have hope and joy. 
We just wrapped up a series last week. For the last six weeks, we've been talking about how we're better together, right? That's not just a t-shirt slogan for us. It's actually a core value. And so we explored how we're better together uh, serving one another and doing life together in small group community. And, and that we call them home groups if you're new. And you're going to hear us talk about those week in and week out because we believe that life change happens in authentic Christian community. And that happens in home group. So we wrapped up that series. We're kicking off today this Be the Church series or the next three weeks talking about these ideas of, of gathering and growing and then going. And then March 29th, write it down. We're not going to be here. We're not going to be having church. We're going to go be the church. And so this is what I want to do this morning. As we look at this idea of what does it mean uh, to be the church as we gather, I want to start with a question. And I get this question a lot. Maybe you've asked this question. Maybe somebody has asked you this question. The question is this, does a follower of Jesus have to attend church? Does a follower of Jesus, does a Christian, a Christ follower have to attend church? Now I'm going to tell you a short answer and then I'm going to explain it. And there are a lot of pastors that are not going to like this short answer. But the short answer is no. No. As a follower of Jesus, it's not a requirement that you attend church. Church attendance is not a salvation issue, right? But the Bible is very clear and very specific. There's a lot of information about how we are to live out our lives of faith, trusting in Jesus and following him. The challenge that we have culturally these days is that typically we ask this question because we have a, our own agenda, right? We have an ulterior motive. We have something else we'd rather do than show up to church on a regular basis. And so uh, uh, the experts, people smarter than me, they, they call this culture that we're living in post-Christian and new age. And there's all kinds of terms that you can interchange for, for what it means. But there are a lot of people in our culture today and a lot of things are driven by this culture that cause us to say, well, you don't really need that, right? We, we, we don't, aren't we smarter than that now? Aren't we more enlightened? Don't we know better than this old, ancient, dusty book that's here in front of you? It's the same problem that our first parents had, right? For those of you that are familiar with Adam and Eve, this is the, this is the issue that they had. They thought they knew better, right? And the, the enemy comes and he, and he tempts them and he says, ah, did God really say that? Ah, is that really what's best? Wouldn't it be okay to do this thing? And, and that's who we are. That's where we get. We say things like this. Um, I, I worship best in the great outdoors. I, I connect with God. I, I'm much more spiritually connected when I'm out in nature enjoying God's creation, right? I'm, when, I, when I'm fishing, when I'm hunting, when I'm playing golf, when I'm uh, on the beach watching the waves roll in, right? And those are good things. Don't get me wrong. I've said all of those myself. That's how I always say when I'm, when I'm sharing a message, I'm just, I'm just preaching to myself and y'all get to listen, right? Th these are the things that we come up with. And, and, and all of those are true. While we can worship and should worship everywhere we go, the problem with being alone in the outdoors, being alone over an extended period of time is that we end up isolated. And, and isolation is where we become set up. Isolation is where our spiritual enemy wants us to be because then he has a better chance to distract us, to tempt us, right, when we're alone. It was true in the beginning, right? He gets Eve off by herself, whispers, oh, should I do that? And all of a sudden, the temptation is there. You know this, right? This is true in your life. It's true in my life. When do you do the things that you know or think the thoughts that you know are not God's best for your life? When you're in a crowd of people or when you're alone? It's when you're alone, right? When we're isolated, the issues, the struggles that you have, they always seem easier to give into when we're alone. It, it, it's no coincidence, for those of you that know the story, when, when, the, when Satan came to tempt Jesus, Jesus was alone. He was in the wilderness for 40 days. He was tired. He was hungry. And so are we, right? When, when we're depressed, when we're disconnected, when we're emotionally starving and we're physically and mentally exhausted, these are the times that we tend to isolate. And that's when the enemy comes. For those of you that are familiar with the rest of that story, Jesus gives us a great example of how to use scripture as a way to fight back. He quotes scripture back to the enemy and, and, and the enemy flees from him and leaves him. And, and I, that's a great example. But I want to focus on a, another example this morning that Jesus gives us. And, and that's the ultimate test, right? When we're looking at the things in our lives and we, we, we wonder if it, whether or not we should do it, the test should always be, maybe you've got the bracelet, what would Jesus do? Or, or better yet, what did 
Jesus do? See, our, God's desire for all of us is that we would become more like Jesus. And so I want us to look today at what Jesus says and more uh, particularly what Jesus did when it comes to this issue of being the church and gathering together. When Jesus began his earthly ministry, after the, the 40 days alone in the desert, he walks into his, his uh, hometown church and he unrolls a scroll and he reads from it. And it's very powerful because he's reading a, a prophecy that was about him. And he says to them, today that prophecy is fulfilled in you hearing this. He announces that he is the Messiah and he begins his earthly ministry. And it says this in Luke 4, chapter, or verse 16. It says, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. Don't, min don't miss this. Many translations say, as was his custom. Some say, as usual. I love what the easy reader version says. It says, as he always did. So Jesus comes out of the wilderness, walks into his hometown church, as he always did on the Sabbath day. Jesus always went to church on the appointed day, the Sabbath. Jesus went to church. For him in that culture, the Sabbath was Saturday. It was sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. And so that was the time when Jews went to the synagogue. And so Jesus went to church on the appointed day. For us, for Christians, for followers of Jesus, that changed. It changed to Sunday when Jesus was raised from the dead on Sunday. That's why we celebrate and why we gather at church on Sundays. I want to take just a second and speak to something that has become, I think, an issue for us. Um, and some of you are going to be offended, those of you watching online especially, uh, but just know that uh, this is intended with all love, and I want to say this the right way. We utilize online church. We stream our services. We do Facebook Live when we have the opportunity, but online church was never meant to replace the physical gathering of the church body in one location. All right? It's a great tool when you're sick, when you're homebound, when you're not able to get out, when you're working shift work, as many of you do, right? When you have opportunities to be out of town, to visit family, to vacations, whatever. We know you have lives, but the online church can easily become a substitute. And what happens is we get disconnected. We get isolated. While we're on this topic, let me touch, I'm, I'm stepping on toes, I might as well step on all 10 of them this morning. Here's something else culturally that I've, I've observed. Uh, we have a tendency nowadays, because we're so uh, video driven and so technology driven, that what we do is we become consumeristic in the way that we worship. And so we watch this church's uh, worship music because we like that style the best. And then we, wor we watch this pastor and listen to his or her teaching because we like that the best. And then we, we, we send our resources and we donate our time, talent, and treasure to, you know, this dog shelter or whoever it is, whatever your thing of the day is. And it's not what is God's best for our lives. God's best is that we would gather together as a church family. And let me just say that this is... It's not a bad thing to watch other messages and to watch other worship stuff. I do this. I, there's probably a half a dozen pastors that I listen to on a regular basis, weekly or every other week, because I long for different teaching. I like to hear different perspectives. And so the important thing is that you understand that, that it's not a replacement for the gathering in a local church body. Also, here's some relief for some of you. Um, attending regularly doesn't mean every Sunday. That we don't have an expectation that every time the doors are open, you guys are going to be here. We know you have lives. We know you, you go on vacation and you do fun things and, and, and you work split, you know, sh uh, shift work and all that. We believe this so much that as a church, we don't plan a bunch of events to draw you back to the church every night of the week. Some churches do that, and I'm not knocking them. I'm just saying that our mission and our vision is clear. We want you here on Sunday, gathered with the body, and celebrating all that God has done. And then we want to send you out, reconnecting during the week with a home group so that you have that personal connection. But then the rest of the week, you're living out your faith in the places where you do life. Here's the, the bottom line. If you, if you spend more time away on Sundays at what I like to call Bed Springs Baptist, right? <laughs> Laying in bed. Then you do gathering on a regular basis. You're out of balance. And we all can get out of balance. So, how do we connect? 
How can we tell if we're getting this right when it comes to this issue of regularly gathering? How much is enough? How much is not enough, right? We have all these questions. What's the test? Well, here is a simple test that Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul gives us. He wrote this in, a, in his first letter to the Corinthians, and I love this because it's kind of a catch-all. He's talking in a different context, but he says something very profound. He says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, all right? The issue that they had at that time was whether or not they should be eating and drinking certain things. And Paul says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So what I like to say is, what's your why? What's the reason behind why you're gathering or why you're not? What's your why? Is it for the glory of God or is it because you're just lazy? Is it for the glory of God or is it because you stayed up binging Netflix all night? Guilty, I've been there, right? What, what is the motivation? Why are you doing what you're doing? When it comes to engaging with a local church body, let me just remind you that it's not about you. That it's about the kingdom. It's about the glory of God. So are you engaging with a local church family in a way that's honoring to God? I asked this question back at the first of the year and I'll just tell you, this has been like... Uh, a, re a reminding uh, face punch to me time and time again. I asked the question, if everybody in the church was engaging like you were, what would the church look like? If everybody attended like you do, if everybody served like you do, if everybody gave like you do, if everybody out did outreach and invited others to come like you do, what would the church look like? So maybe the question this morning shouldn't be, uh, should a follower of Jesus attend church? Maybe a better question is this. Should a follower of Jesus engage with a local church family? And that answer is absolutely yes. It is a family. The church is a spiritual family. And like a family, we're going to have issues, right? We're not going to agree on everything. We're going to have different political views. We're going to think differently about different things. That's okay. We're going to fight sometimes. We're going to have to seek forgiveness and offer forgiveness to one another because people are people. And, and, and like a family, we, you know, we all got that crazy uncle, right? That shows up at the family reunion and you know who it is. And if they're here today, don't look at them, all right? We don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. But it's just a truth. A spiritual family is just like your regular family. And we have issues. Moms, let me ask you this. What would happen at your house if everybody only showed up at mealtime? Well, huh? Yeah, right. You're saying they, that's how it is at my house. I do everything, but no. If, if you, mom and dad, if, if you, all of you, only showed up at mealtime. Who would vacuum? Who would clean? Who would do laundry? Who would grocery shop? Who would feed the dogs and cats, right? Who would take care of what needs? We all have a part to play. That's why I love that the body, uh, the Bible calls us the, the, the body of Christ, right? If we're just hands and feet laying dismembered, we look like a zombie church, right? But we are, we are connected together. We all have different gifts and talents that we bring together to serve one another. So whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. And that's the ultimate test. Am I doing this, when it comes to this issue of gathering together, am I doing it for the glory of God? If not, then maybe we've slipped into some consumeristic Christianity where it becomes about us and meeting our needs and not the kingdom. Church attendance is not a salvation issue, but it is, I believe, a spiritual maturity issue. As we follow Jesus, we hopefully are growing in that faith. We're learning how to become more like him. That's God's desire for us, to sanctify us, to make us more like Jesus, and in so doing, mature us in our faith. And we can't do that without our spiritual family. So this morning, in the time that I have left, I want to quickly give you three reasons why we gather, why we do what we do, why we gather on Sundays in the ways that we do. And we're going to unpack that looking at a verse in Acts. Uh, this is from the early church. This is an example of what they did in the very beginning and why we do what we do today. It says this in Acts 2, verses 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. 
So we see them gathering corporately in the temple courts. We see them meeting in homes like we do in home groups, living out, focused on the apostles' teaching, which is the, the word of God, the Bible, learning that and putting it into practice in their lives. We see them doing life together. So three reasons why we gather as a church on Sundays. Number one, number one is encouragement. We gather on Sundays for encouragement. When we see what God is doing in our lives and in the lives of others, it's encouraging, right? When we show up here on Sunday and sometimes we're struggling and sometimes we've seen victories that week, but we, we praise God for who he is, for his goodness and how he is working in our lives. And we're filled with awe and wonder as we look around and we see all that God is doing. Listen, y'all, I, I, I can't tell you enough. When we see somebody who has been at the depths of addiction in their life, kids taken away from them, you know, their, their life, they just wreck their life. And then all of a sudden, they, they turn their life over to Jesus and they're delivered from this addiction. And they begin walking in a new life. And all of a sudden, they don't need drugs anymore. And their kids have been restored. Their relationships have been restored. And, and they're following Jesus. And now they're rescuing other people and helping them come to church. When we see couples who are ready to throw in the towel and quit on a marriage, and they've decided to trust Jesus and they put their focus on him, and that relationship has been restored. When we see physical healings happening, people who have cancer, who are cancer-free, when we see that happening, it is encouraging, isn't it? Sure it is. Does that happen here? Yes, it does. Clap your hands if you know where that's happened in this church. If you've seen it happen. We've seen it happen over the last year. We've seen generosity like this. We see strangers come into town and people give up their homes. We see people giving to clean water and giving weekly, sacrificially. We, we see God calling us together and using us together. And it, it's encouraging, I, I gotta tell you. You can't come to church on a Sunday and not be encouraged. Being together encourages us in our faith. Paul says this to the Romans. He says, when we get together, I want to encourage you in your faith, but I also want to be encouraged by yours. He writes this letter telling them that he wants to come and visit them, that he wants to meet with them. And in his anticipation, what he expects to happen when he meets with them is that he's going to be encouraged by the faith of the Romans and they're going to be encouraged by his faith. It happens. It's encouraging to be here. That's why we do what we do like at the front. I know you introverts hate our greeting time. I get it. But that's why we, we do the high five and the handshake and the hug and the knuckle bump and the elbow, all that, you know. It's to welcome one another. And do you know... I'll just tell you, I didn't read 1 Peter. Peter says, give each other a holy kiss. I'm sparing y'all, okay? But do you know that some people come in here on Sunday morning and the only positive interaction that they have all week long is the high five or the handshake or the knuckle bump they get here? That's why it matters. That's why it's so important. People come in here each week burdened, just overloaded by life. And to see smiling faces and people who are on fire and, and just here to celebrate and worship Jesus, it is is encouraging. That's why we use the music that we use. That's why we begin our, our services with an upbeat, music, uh, upbeat song, right? Everybody comes in fired up and then we, we kind of focus worshipful, more purposeful music in the middle. And then at the end of our service, those of you who are new today, at the end of our service, there's going to be another upbeat song to send us out on a high note. That's why we do that. It's strategic. It's purposeful. It's encouraging. And all of it is to the praise of and glory of God. Psalm 33 says this, Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-string lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. Now, I don't know what a ten-string lyre is, but I've commissioned the band to find one. I want to know because I want to play a song on that 10 string. I don't know if that's even possible. I'm sure the guitars will, will suffice. But um, it says sing a new song. And so people ask me from time to time, they're like, Wes, why don't we do hymns? Well, you know what? Sometimes we do. Sometimes we kind of, like we did this morning uh, with It Is Well, we, we take a reworked version of an old hymn. And I'll just be honest with you, I don't know hymns. I didn't grow up in the church. And as a church who is focused on reaching the unchurched, we could do a lot of churchy things and draw church people, but we'll miss unchurched people. And so to reach people nobody else is reaching, you know this, we have to do things that nobody else is doing. And one of those things that we have chosen to do strategically is making the choice of music that we use. We use modern 
upbeat, different worship music. It's intentional. Sing to him a new song, right? It's interesting when I, when I get feedback or sometimes I get grief um, from folks about not doing hymns. It's church people that, that are mad. And, and I get it because they grew up in a traditional church. They, they, have a, they have a heart and a passion. My wife knows every hymn ever written. I don't mean to embarrass her, but she does. She grew up in church and she loves the old hymns. I didn't. I don't know them. And so it, it, it's not a connection for me, right? I don't know what it means when somebody tells me to raise my Ebenezer. It just sounds weird, all right? Church people know what I'm talking about. We gather on Sundays to encourage each other, to be encouraged by each other, and we gather, number two, for instruction. We gather together corporately in this place for instruction. Sundays are for us the best opportunity that we have to instruct the crowds. Remember, this is what Jesus was about. Drawing a crowd together, teaching them, healing them, sharing his wisdom. And each week at Cedar Creek Church, there is teaching, there is instruction, there's preaching, communicating, whatever you want to call it, and it's all strategic. We, we, we strategically instruct the church from this book, from the Bible, about how we should live our lives, about what is God's best for us. And it's all about the person and work of Jesus, who he is, what he has done, and why that gives us hope and joy. It's called the good news. It's called the gospel. We believe it. If, you, if you're new this morning, hear me say this. Because sometimes we get a lot of grief in the community. People say, oh, Cedar Creek, that's where all the sinners go. Yeah, come on, bring it. I'm down with that, right? Sinners saved by grace, the grace of Jesus. And this book is true. And we believe that God the Father sent God the Son to this earth on a rescue mission. To live a sinless life, to die a death on a cross, to take our place. He was dead, buried, three days, rose again, just as he said he was going to do. We believe it. We've seen the transforming power that comes when our faith is in Jesus. And we need the instruction of the truth of his word. The Bible says that God is one God, but he has eternally existed in the three persons of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we believe it. Again, culturally, we have a, a tendency to, we, you hear things like, well, there are many paths to God. There are many ways to God. And I'm, I'm here to tell you this morning, that's not true. There is one way, one path. His name is Jesus. Wes, how can you say that? Well, again, because Jesus said it. Jesus said this, I am the way and the truth and the life. And don't miss this. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Is that clear? Is that fuzzy or muddy in any way? It's not. It's not. And, and I tell you that out of love this morning because it's very easy to get sucked into what our culture says and, and, and to believe that there are, there are other ways other than faith alone in Christ alone. We are saved by grace, not by any works that we do. And we believe it. And that's the kind of instruction. That's why every week you get what we call life applicable teaching. Every message at Cedar Creek Church, we're not going to go line by line and verse by verse and go so deep that we confuse you with, the, with theology. Head knowledge is great. It's good to study the Bible, but it's even better to put it into practice. And so when you leave a Cedar Creek Church service on a Sunday, you have something that you can do with the truth that you've heard on Monday morning. That's the goal. We're intentional about that and we're intentional about the way we communicate the message of Jesus with our kids and with our students. There's a reason why we do age-appropriate worship. And if you're new here this morning, let me just tell you, this isn't so that we just get the kids out of here. If the kids were in here with adults, they'd be, first of all, bored out of their minds listening to me talk. Some of you are already there. It's okay. But if they were in here, they'd really be bored and they'd make you distracted, you wouldn't get to hear. So we create environments every week and we spend a lot of time and a lot of prayer, a lot of effort, a lot of resources, a lot of money to have great environments where kids and students can learn about Jesus in a way that connects with them. We take the whole message of this book and for our little ones, we break it down into basic truths. God made me, God loves me, Jesus wants to be my friend forever. And then as they grow and they get into elementary age, they learn that I can trust God no matter what and I need to make the wise choice and I should treat others the way I want to be treated. Biblical truth boiled down into basic truths. And then they get into middle school and high school and they learn he is, I am, we are. And they all go, which I love, right? It's like a war chant. He is, God is God. No, there is no other God other than our God. 
I am who he says I am, not who culture says I am. I find my identity in who God says I am. And we are, the church, followers of him, called to share his love with a broken, fallen world. We gather to encourage each other. We gather for instruction. And last but not least, we gather on Sundays for direction. We gather together because we need direction. The Bible says that where there is no vision, the people perish. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no message from God, people don't control themselves. But blessed is the one who obeys wisdom's instruction. The pastors and staff of this church are called to the work that God has given us to do. And because of that, we are gonna be held accountable to how we handle this calling whether or not we serve you and teach you God's word. And God has given us a very clear, specific mission of helping people find their way back to God and how we live that out of, of reaching others, connecting with them in authentic community, helping all of us grow, serving one another inside the church and outside the church so that we can honor God with our lives. That's our mission and vision in a nutshell. In all of this, we, we prayerfully consider, we bring these church-wide series and the teaching series that we do we pray through them and we talk through them and we plan and we line it up so that it matches with this mission and vision. I say in our new members class, and I don't know that I've said it in here in a while, but I will say it again. Um, we are not naive enough or arrogant enough to believe that we're the only church for everybody in Aiken County. We have a very specific mission and vision and we hope and pray that as God leads you, that this is the place where he wants you to be, this would be your church home. But if it's not, there are 300 churches in Aiken County. And we just want you to be where God wants you to be. We pray about that. We're serious about that. Because when people come that have their own ideas, their own agendas, or you should do this, or you should change this, or you should sing these songs and not do this, what happens is you end up miserable. Because we're not going to change to your way. And then you make everybody else miserable around you. And so we, would just want, we want you to be where you can buy in where you can attend regularly, where you can serve regularly, where you can give sacrificially, where you can live the life of faith with, with all that you are. Excited about it. Focused on it. We need direction. Because it's not about us. It's about Jesus. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says this. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, there it is, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. What's he talking about? What day is approaching? Well, remember me saying that I believe that this, we all believe this book is true? Well, we believe that Jesus is coming back one day because he said he was. And none of us know when that day is. Jesus was very clear that no man knows the day or the hour. And if you've got one of those crazy uncles that's got all the charts and all that and he's predicted when it's going to happen, he's crazy. It's not, he doesn't know. None of us do. But he is coming back. And until that day, or until he calls us to be home with him, we are to be about the work that he has called us to. And so this morning as we close, I, I want to ask you just to close your eyes and bow your heads kind of quiet your heart. I know I've, I've thrown a lot of information and content at you this morning. And I just want to give us an opportunity to pray, to listen to that small, still voice that God speaks to us with. As we think about this idea of what it means to be the church and how we gather and why we gather and why we do what we do. And pray that God would reveal to you what next step you need to take. What step is it? Is it a first step of faith of trusting Jesus to be the Lord of your life? Is it a next step to, to connect in a home group or to be, uh, become part of a team serving on Sunday to use the gifts and talents that you have? Whatever it is, it's been my prayer all week and I pray now that you would take that step. Father, I, I thank you for your word that is true. I thank you for the example of the early church. I thank you, Jesus, for your example. That you showed up to church regularly. That you made it a part of your lives. And that you have given us the church as a place to gather. That we are your body. That you're, we are your hands and feet. The bride of Christ. Come together to worship you. To celebrate who you are and all that you have done. And all that you continue to do in us and through us. And Lord, we know 
that you are the only way and that when our time is through on this earth it's going to come down to whether our faith was in you or not as to whether or not we spend eternity with you and so I pray in this place this morning that all of us would receive that truth that we would begin to live our lives in a way that reflects that truth that we would not be afraid to tell others of the hope that we have in you when given that opportunity Lord I thank you for the encouragement that's received when we gather for the direction that you give us and Lord the instruction of your word may we learn to study it and apply it and live it out each and every day of our lives we love you we thank you and we pray all of this in the mighty name of Jesus amen